Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome into the final Aftershock of 2022. Uh, you'll hear a little audio in the background. I apologize, we're working on that uh, right now. There's a new board control that is a tiny little speaker sitting over there that's pumping out audio. It's the equivalent of a set of headphones on high. But em Emily's about to fix that for us. I just don't know how to turn down the speakers on the board. I've never had to do that before. Nuh-uh, not that. See, I did that same thing. It didn't work. No, not those. Doesn't work. It's coming through the headphones. <laughs> no, it's not. It's coming through the speakers on the board right there. <laughs> it's not. It's not the end of the world. But I've, yeah, I, I thought the same thing. I unplugged. There you go. There. Did you do something? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Losing cue. So when I come back up, when you're done, I'll fix that. There we go. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome into the Aftershock. So you get the behind the scenes stuff here all the time. Now <laughs> we've got the audio figured out. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's see here. So Ronald's here, Mitch is here, Mary's here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Sebastian, do you know who Michael Savage is? Have I ever listened to any of his talk shows? Do you like him? Would you wish he went on Mark Levin's show? Or vice versa. You know, I haven't listened to Savage in years. I mean, I remember early 2000s is when I first was introduced to, to his show. And then he was the, he was, he was Alex Jones before Alex Jones was Alex Jones. You know what I mean? So um, I honestly haven't listened to him in years. So I, I don't know what he's been doing lately. Um, yeah, I don't, even, I don't know. I don't know anything about him. Uh, let's see. Karen's here. Aaron's here. Good to have you guys. Heidi. Loanne, Steve. All right. Wow, we got a good turnout here for the final. It's the final one. That's why. Everyone's like, it's the last time this year we're going to have an aftershock. Driver update. Will malware bytes search drivers? How reliable? How reliable is downloading drivers from the company? Oh, yeah. Ronald, if you if you have a Dell computer or an Asus or, an, or you know a Toshiba or whatever, and you go to the manufacturer's website and download the drivers, that's perfect. What ends up happening, though, is manufacturers, we have this situation on our bench right now with a computer we're building for a client. This client runs uh, a convenience store chain around Nebraska. And his point of sale system requires Windows 10 32-bit. It has to be 32-bit, not 64-bit, which is what everything has been for the last you know 15 years. So the challenge now is not only do we have to get Windows 10, which is now considered an old operating system, but we have to get it in 32-bit. We have to find hardware that supports that. So we're having to build hardware that's a generation old just to get 32-bit drivers. The problem is the manufacturer of the boards doesn't provide 32-bit drivers. So we have to go back to the manufacturers of the chipsets that the, the, the motherboard manufacturer purchased to put on their board. And they provide drivers. So there's multiple levels of drivers. So what all these driver updater companies do is um, you install driver updater on your computer and it runs a check of all the chipsets in your computer and then all the drivers that you have installed and it uploads all those drivers to its driver service and then anybody else that has the same chipset well there's a and their driver is older than the one that's uploaded those get sucked down into the computer so literally the more people that use it the more drivers there are and once in a while the driver updater people will go and upload their own sets of drivers and things or they'll scrape them off of manufacturers websites or whatnot well, the challenge becomes IBM, or sorry, not IBM, Lenovo, uh, may have used the same chipset as Dell in a laptop, but they may have deployed them differently. They may have tweaked the way that the board is constructed, the software is built, to utilize that chip in a way that is different than the other model. And so if you load the driver from a Lenovo on a Dell, will it work? Maybe. Should you do it? No. But if you have driver updater, it's going to do it all day long. That's why driver updaters are, are not, they serve no function, no purpose whatsoever. The only places that you want to get your drivers from on your own is originally from the manufacturer or possibly through Microsoft Update, although we just had a story about how they got gamed. Um, the good news there is if you have Sophos, you have somebody watching your back in case that happens to you. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Well, 
this is, I'm glad you asked this, Sebastian. Sebastian asked, why would used cars decrease in price 30 to 50 percent in this time of inflation? Um, because the inflation numbers are about to roll over. Um, what is causing inflation right now? Let, let's let's step back and like look at the, the at the numbers and say what not not what's causing it in a macro sense, but what is inflating? Like what is going up and causing people to have to pay more for stuff? Um, well, energy has gone up. Uh, I know that uh, my wife freaked out when she saw the gas bill because the, you know how they put the little bars on the bill about your usage. Well. Do you know that those bars, uh, at least on the Black Hills energy bills, don't represent usage in like cubic meters of gas or anything? They measure dollars spent. So we are spending double this year. We're using the same amount of gas as we did last year, but we're paying double for it. So when you double the cost of energy, uh, it's the production of goods takes energy, and that means goods are going to go up in price. So energy is way up. Cars, used cars, are way up. Why are they up? Well, because there weren't any new cars available to purchase because of supply chain constraints. Well, now those supply chain constraints are being resolved, not because the supply chains are fixed, but because demand is falling off and it's allowing the, the broken supply chains to kind of catch up. Um, as a result, used cars you have, were, went way up in price, huge increases in price. I think I, I famously told you how I traded in my F-350 pickup truck with 50,000 or 40,000 miles on it um, for a brand new F-150 Platinum with every bell and whistle I could think to put on it. Like literally there was nothing else to add to this truck and it was an even trade. That's how much the price of used cars went up because new cars just weren't available. So now what's happening is the reverse. So now what we're seeing is People, okay, let me, let me start, let me give you some stats. The average monthly car payment that a person is paying right now for a vehicle is about 700 bucks. That's the average new car car payment, 700 bucks. The, the, many people are paying $1,000 or more for a vehicle, which just think about that for a second. $1,000 a month for a car. That used to be like a mortgage payment, right? But that's just a car payment now. So $1,000 a month for a car. And you could afford that because there were stimulus checks and everybody had stay-at-home money and you were working remotely, so you were working seven jobs and no, none of your employers knew that, so you were cashing seven paychecks and life was great because uh, that's, well, that's why people work remote. Um, long story short, that everybody had money. So now what's happening is the price of energy and the price of everything has gone up. Uh, eggs at Hy-Vee were $6 a dozen the other day. Six dollars a dozen, up from a dollar a dozen. So food inflation is a real thing. So the cost to eat is going up. The cost to heat your homes was going up. This summer, the cost of fuel was ridiculous. It has moderated a bit. Um, whether it'll stay low, who knows? I don't want to ever hope that things go bad. You know what I mean? Um, so everybody was paying more for everything. Well, suddenly those car payments got a lot less affordable. Like, it was hard to make that car payment and deal with all the inflation at the same time, especially when there was no more stimulus checks coming in. So people start maxing out their credit cards, extending debt, and the, the general perception is that the consumer will come to the end of his or her rope financially sometime in early to mid next year, 2023. So yay, have Merry Christmas, everybody. Um, but as how this is impacting used car prices is truly unique. So... There is um, a methodology among car lenders, right? So let's say you buy a used car at the height of pandemic pricing, okay? So you, at, when the price is way up. Inflation, the reason inflation is up is because used car prices were up so much and housing prices are up. Those two things are sticky because you have a car payment and your car payment is going to go for like seven years or six years, or five years, or four years, or however long, it's sticky. So when those prices go up, everybody who bought a car in the last year paid way more than they paid in previous years at a higher interest rate. So their payments are really high, and that the price they pay for the vehicle goes up, that's inflation. Housing prices, very sticky. Most people sign one-year leases, two-year leases, or 30-year, 15-year mortgages. 
when the cost of the, the interest is going up and the price of the homes was up high, everybody was paying more. And even if the prices of houses come down, you still have a lease. You still have a mortgage. Even if the value of your car drops, you still have a car payment. That's still the same. They don't change. So that's why it's sticky. It stays around. So like Sebastian's asking, what would cause those prices to drop? Well, let's say that the banks decide to cannibalize each other. Hello. It's actually happening right now. So there used to be this, this thing where, okay, you come into a car dealership. You've been driving this car you bought two years ago at the height of the pandemic. Um, you're tired of it. You want a new car. So you take the car into the dealership because you want to trade it in. When you find that the, the value of used cars, because you paid at the height, the value has already dropped 15% from what you paid here. It's going to go down more. So when you come in to trade your car in, you realize that you're underwater that not only will you have to trade the vehicle in, but you'll have to pony up thousands of dollars in cash in order to get into that new car because the new bank won't finance a new vehicle for you because you already have a loan for a previous vehicle. And because you're underwater, you have to close that loan out before you can get a loan for the new vehicle. As a result, dealership does not sell a car, lender does not finance a car, and the bank that has your loan now you, you basically hate that bank because you're paying a ridiculous amount of money for a car that's not worth what it was once worth and you don't want it anymore anyway and you can't get out of it. So what do you do? Well, if you're a lender, you remove the requirement that you can't have more than one car loan at a time. Now, you might think, th this happens to me when I go to buy a car because I have like all the shock cars and then they're like, Thor, you've got like seven cars. You're like, Jay Leno, you know, like, how many cars do you need, man? And I'm like, I don't drive them all. I just drive the one. You know, this is for the shop. You know, it's like for the guys to go do on-sites and things. So you go and you, you go to buy the new car. And the new bank says, sure, Billy Bob, we're going to go ahead and sell you this new car. And it's going to be a cheaper price, even though the interest rate's a little higher. It's a cheaper price, which means your payments will be lower on this car than they are on your other car. The bank knows you're going to default on the expensive car, the car that you're paying $200 more per month on a payment on that you don't even want anymore, that you're just going to walk away from. Now, normally, that would mean you're a bad credit risk, that you don't pay your bills, you don't fulfill your obligations. But we're coming into a world now, have you been to a car dealership lately? If you haven't, if you're, looking for, if you're bored on a Saturday afternoon, and you want to go screw with a sales guy, go try to find one at a car dealership. Remember when you go to the car dealership and you get assaulted by people? Not anymore. There might be two salespeople on the entire sales floor. There's hardly any cars on the lot. Or if there are cars, they're all used cars and they're all expensive. So now the challenge is going to become banks are going to encourage you to default on your expensive pandemic car that you don't want anymore in order to sell you a new car to capture your business as a customer. And banks are going to do this to each other. So de defaults on vehicles are right now at 2019 levels already. So we're at pre-pandemic levels already. It's going to get worse. People are going to default on these vehicles they paid ridiculous money for and entered into these ridiculous contracts on. Does this sound familiar? Because they're underwater. Because the value of the property, I mean the car, has dropped below what they paid for it. And they're saying to themselves, why am, I, why am I on the hook paying all this extra money for something that's not worth it anymore? I feel I got robbed. I got cheated. I shouldn't have to pay this. Can, what, what can I do? Can I walk away from this? What happens if I walk away? Well, then the bank gets the car. You get a black mark on your credit, but that's it. They, they may come after you. They may not. Just depends. Um, <clears throat> guess what? During the pandemic, everybody had money. So what wasn't happening? Repossessions. No one was repoing cars. So the repo men, most of those businesses went out of business because there was nothing to repossess. So now we don't have as many repo com companies. The repo companies can't get employees because people aren't working for some reason. And 
Banks have an all-time high need for repossessions. Automotive repossessions are 13% up over pre-pandemic levels right now, today. They are so busy that the repo companies are booked full. They have no capacity to repossess any other vehicles. And if they did have a person to go out and get the vehicle, they don't have a place to store the vehicle because their storage is full. So banks are actually paying premiums to repossession companies to get them to repo their cars first. Why? Because they know the first bank to sell their repossessed vehicles will get higher sales, high, higher dollar amounts than the banks that come later. Because there's going to be such a glut of especially high-end used cars on the market that the prices are going to drop another 30 to 50% in 2023. And as the prices drop, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now you have this loan, you're even more underwater because the, the value of your vehicle has dropped even further and you want to get into a new vehicle and you can't, so you just walk away from this one and it creates another repossession, which creates another default, which, and it goes on and on. But don't worry, you can still drive away in your brand new car that you just got from the dealership because the other bank was willing to fund you. The world we live in is upside down and backwards, guys. So what's going to happen to inflation? What's the Fed trying to do to inflation? Now, there are different schools of thought on this, and I don't want to be the doom guy, you know? So I always try to find, I try to be aware of what could happen so I can prepare for it, but I, I try to hope for the most likely outcome. Because there are sigma deviation outcomes on both sides, right? Next year, inflation could go down to 1.5% and everything, everything could be right with the world again, right? That would be like, wow, optimistic, ain't going to happen. Next year, the dollar could crash, and we could all have nothing, and we could all be scrounging for food and shooting each other like a zombie apocalypse movie. Not going to happen. So the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? So what is going to happen? I think that we're going to be in a scenario where we see less inflation. What does less inflation mean? So inflation, let's say it's at 6% year over year right now roughly. So less would be maybe 4%, 3%, right? But there's going to be sectors of the, that doesn't mean the life's going to be great. What that means is there's going to be some sectors of the economy that see stupid inflation, like food and energy costs. And there's other areas of the economy that are going to see dramatic deflation, housing values, car values. Those are going to offset to create a combined lower inflation rate, but make you absolutely miserable in the process. That is what I believe the likely outcome of the whole the whole thing is. It's the hard landing. Um, that's why. Um, so think about think about all the tech workers that are unemployed. Um, I know a guy here in Omaha who was working at Meta, who was making, I don't know, well over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in the data center for Meta here in town. Where is he going to find a job like that here in Omaha? There's, what, five data centers to go to? People are already working there. You know, it's like, where are you going to go? So, yes, he'll find a job, and yes, he has great skills, and yes, he's amazing, and he'll get paid well. The question is, where is he going to find a job to pay that? So these high-tech people that are getting laid off, they all have like six-month severance packages. In fact, this guy from Meta said he'd be good through the summer of next year before... The, the money from Meta dried up. So these severance packages are very generous. So the workers are okay for now, but what happens to their Teslas and their Land Rovers and their Porsches and their Lambos when they don't have that income anymore? When the gravy train runs dry, you're going to see these high-end cars coming. Companies like Carvana are in real trouble. In fact, Carvana is doing something behind the scenes that it's never done before. It's amazing, right? So what is Carvana? If you don't know, Carvana is a, is a company where you buy and sell cars. So it's kind of like uh, you have a car for sale. You can sell it to Carvana. Carvana gives you money for it. They take the car, clean it up, you know, fix it up, and then sell it to a retail buyer. And they make the money. They're a used car dealer, basically. Carvana's in trouble because they bought cars from people at the height of the pandemic for huge amounts of money. 
Now they have to turn around and sell those cars after cleaning them, moving them, getting them all fixed up, whatever had to happen. Now they're going to sell the cars, but the value of the cars is off by 15%. Well, they weren't going to make 15% on the car when they sold it in the first place, so now Carvana is underwater. So Carvana now is in trouble financially. They need to liquidate cars just to stay afloat, basically. No pun intended. So what are they doing? They're offering to sell their used cars back to dealers, to dealerships, at wholesale prices. So we're talking $5,000, $8,000 below what you see priced on Carvana. They're willing to sell that car to a dealer for that price. It's not looking good, guys. Carvana is like the canary in the coal mine. That's what's happening on the ground right now. I have seen the screenshots of the dealer sales screens where here's the, here's the car on Carvana, <clears throat> retail price. Here's the exact same car on the dealer portal at $5,000 less. So it's, it is happening right now. You're just not hearing about it yet. And it's not going to be reflected in the numbers for three months. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, I think I may have talked about this, I forget, maybe a week or two ago, but there's two different employment surveys out there. There's the household survey, which is like ADP data. This is like the company that prints the paycheck says we print fewer paychecks this month. You know, that's, that's the household data. And then you have like the establishment data. That's the government data about how many payrolls and adjustments and all this other stuff are in there. Well, around mid-year, something snapped in that relationship. Before that, the two are trending together very closely. There's deviation, but they're, they're, they're within a reasonable discrepancy, right? The household number has pretty much been flat for the last six months, flat to slightly declining. The establishment number has shown an increase of 1.1 million jobs. So like on the chart, the establishment number goes like this, and the, the household number is down here. What's that discrepancy? What is that? What, what's happening here? Well, the answer is the government's lying about the employment status of people. <laughs> simple answers, simple questions. Um, and they're fixing that now through downward revisions. So expect to see downward revisions in labor numbers. Now, these are the same labor numbers that the Federal Reserve has been using to jack up interest rates, to try to crush the job market, to try to cause deflation. If we take money away from people, they will buy fewer things. If they buy fewer things, there will be less in sales. The prices will come down because there will be too many goods available and not enough buyers. So retailers will lower their prices to move goods and prices come down. Voila, we've killed inflation by making people miserable. As opposed to the Reagan model, which, yes, did have interest rates increases. I'm not saying that you can't have that. But they also tackled it from a supply side. This would be like the Federal Reserve saying, we have to raise interest rates, but we're going to open up fracking across the entire country on all federal lands. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's going to take like five years before any of that energy ever makes it onto the market. But the futures prices of energy are going to come down because that energy is going to come out of the ground. But that supply stuff isn't happening anywhere. It's not happening from a production standpoint, it's not happening from an energy standpoint, it's not happening from a manufacturing standpoint. The services sector is not growing. Literally, it's not happening. So we just have the bad, the, the, high, the high interest rates. We don't have the growth policies. So that's the whole point. They're trying to crush the labor market. So the Fed's been looking at these numbers now for how many months, saying we have to keep raising interest rates because the labor market is still stubbornly strong. Why is it so strong? This makes no sense. Why is the labor market so incredibly strong? The answer is it's not. Look at continuing, continuing job, jobless claims versus uh, new jobless claims. New jobless claims is pretty much unchanged. You have the normal churn, basically. Continuing claims, huge. Look at people on disability, huge. That's where the people went. They're either choosing not to work, which we talked about last week, or they are disabled in some way now that was the, in which they were not disabled in 2019. And that's leading them to be not able to work. Some people have long COVID. Some people have other issues that uh, may or may not have been brought about by various medications. Um, that we, we're just now starting to hear some of this stuff coming out about. 
Um, so yeah, so it's the whole the whole thing is a mess, and it's a mess that yes, it's gonna. Then why are we talking about it? If there's nothing we can do about it, and it's just gonna give you stress to talk about it, right? Why are we talking about it? Because if you understand what's happening around you, you might not be able to avoid the poo storm, but you can find the least poopy place to be in the poo storm. So, for example, um, my wife and I were looking, we're, we're kind of casually looking for property, um, something like five-ish five -ish acres, you know, something like that, um, and our plan was to move, right? Well, now interest rates went up. We were going to finance this. Well, now we have a nice like 2.75% interest rate in the house that we're in. Why on earth would we ever sell that house? Even if we decided to move out and move somewhere else, we, we financially, we should rent the house, right? Because you can't get a 2.75% interest rate anymore. So why would you give that up? It costs so much more to move now than it does... So people who are elderly, who live in big houses, are choosing not to move into a smaller, more manageable house because it will actually cost them more money to buy the smaller house than they are spending to be in the bigger house. So they stay in the bigger house. This is causing people who are in the mid-market. So you have your, your starter houses, then you have your mid-market houses, then you have your like prime earning years house with family and bedrooms and everything else. So there's a natural flow of people. They start out with starter homes, then they upgrade, and then they upgrade again. Well, the people at the top are not leaving. They're not moving out. So these houses are not available. The people in the middle are not moving because it doesn't make financial sense to move because the interest rates on the houses they have are so low. So the people in the starter homes are paying more than ever to get into the crappiest houses because there's a very few of them available. That's what's keeping the price of housing up right now, by the way. There are very few houses available. Maybe I should just rent, but oh shoot, the rent just doubled. Some people are facing double rent in some parts of the country, year over year. Part of that's because landlords weren't allowed to charge rent for two years. That money's gotta get made up somewhere. So if you know the world around you and you understand what's going on, you can make informed decisions. Like maybe we shouldn't buy a new house right now. Maybe instead we should bank the money that we're saving and put that toward a down payment or a full purchase maybe of a new house. Another example, one of my employees cracked up one of the vehicles. Um, it was a stupid accident. It was one of those, it was a snowy day. Um, you know, and nobody was behaving poorly or driving aggressively or anything like that. It was just, you tap the brakes at the wrong time on a high grade hill, covered in ice, and you slid. It is what it is, right? Do we buy a new vehicle right now? No. Do, you know, do we fix that vehicle right now? The damage wasn't bad, it just kind of rubbed up against another car. It's probably mostly paint damage. But it's so dirty out right now, you can't see it anyway. Like I tried to look at the car and see the damage. I couldn't find it because of the, the road schmutz on the car. Once we wash it, I'm sure we'll see it. Um, do I just wait? Because maybe these small little cars that we use for Schrock are going to be cheap enough that I'll be able to just buy one rather than finance it. Or, you know, my, my ops manager is driving a Ford Ranger we got a sweet deal on it. It was a brand new 2019 Ford Ranger that we bought in 2020. And uh, got a, you know, pre-pandemic price, got a great deal on it. It was amazing. Well, you know, he was coming from a car. He didn't want to go to a big F-150 or something. You know, so we put him in a Ranger. It was kind of a compromise. Well, now he's driven the Ranger for a while. And he's like, this isn't so big of a deal. I probably wouldn't mind a bigger truck. Okay, so let's look at an F-150. Have you looked at the price of an F-150 lately? Maybe those will come down. If those come down 30%, maybe I'll buy an F3 or an F-150, you know? So that that's what it's going to happen. There's going to be an equilibrium that's achieved. So we're going to have six months of crazy headlines that don't seem to make any sense because everything you're hearing out of mainstream media will say, everything is fine, everything is awesome. Yeah, there's challenges, but individual stories, but there is no bigger picture. Everything is great. Then you're going to see the headlines in alternative media 
telling you that the end of the world is coming. Michael Snyder will be telling you that the world's going to collapse tomorrow. I have a new book out, by the way. Um, okay. Um, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And the truth is that in Nebraska and in Iowa and in the Midwestern states, we tend to be a little more frugal and a little more balanced, and we don't have a lot of the, the huge swings that you see in other places. Um, so some places it's going to be really bad. Not sure that I want to live in Chicago or Denver or Ohio right now. I mean, there's nothing wrong with those places. I just, I feel like those are the places that are going to get hit. Um, right now is the time to have sureties, to find good deals, to lock in good deals, you know, to, to go in with your neighbor and buy a half a cow together. You know, I, I can tell you a great a great ranch out by Alliance to buy your beef from. Um, Hag is amazing. Uh, so if you you know if you do stuff like that, you can achieve like, so I think a, a half a cow is going for like sixteen hundred bucks right now for a half a cow. So if you add up what you're going to spend on meat for the next let's say six months, and then you go in with another family on this and say okay let's split the meat. You're going to save 30%, 40% on your, your meat expense. And, you know, you hear these stories about like, oh, we're going to be eating insects. And you're like, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not going to be indulging in the chocolate-covered crickets anytime soon, okay? Um, you, know, the, you know, you get the little Santas for Christmas, the little chocolate marshmallow Santas you give the little kids. At least that's what my Bernus always gave me when I was a kid. Aunt Bernus always gave me the, the chocolate Santas. And, you, and I didn't even like marshmallow things. But they were chocolate, and by golly, I would eat, oh, eat those chocolate marshmallow Santas because that's what I had. If you give me the box of chocolate-covered crickets, I will not have the same reaction to that. You know what? I, I'll probably try to re-gift them to my son. <laughs> Here, Jay, have a cricket. <laughs> They're delicious. Here, Lou, you're four. Eat this chocolate-covered bug. And even Lou, at four years old, is going to be like, that's suspect. I don't know, Dad. I don't think I should eat this. Chocolate is good. Bugs are bad. You put them together. Hmm. The truth is in the middle? Like, I don't want to get in the middle of that. So, you know, I don't think we're all going to be eating bugs and insects anytime soon. Um, on the other hand, meat is getting expensive, guys. Like I said, eggs is up six bucks a dozen. Last time, last time I, I luckily, one of my employees has a chicken coop. And, uh, their, his chickens lay one more egg a day than his family eats, and so I'm able to uh, I'm able to score some farm fresh eggs if you know what I mean from time to time, uh, and they're absolutely delicious. And uh, you know, I, I've, what's your input cost on this? Like you get you get you're getting six eggs a day. What do you do? He goes, it's like a handful of grain, and I get six eggs a day. <laughs> like oh my gosh, and they're like fresh, fresh, fresh eggs. They're not, you know. They're farm fresh eggs, guys. It's just beautiful stuff. So anyway, I don't want chickens. I don't want to deal with the chickens, but I love the eggs. So we can work something out. We can work something out here. But anyway, give your boss eggs. It works out. So uh, with that said, guys, I'll uh, I'll step back now, get off the soapbox, and I'm going to check the comments here and see what you guys want to talk about. Uh, but all I'm saying is if you're thinking about buying a car, you should wait. If you're thinking about moving out of your house and you have a good interest rate, you shouldn't do it. Just make smart, stable decisions so that if there's fluctuations in the cost of things, you've got some backstop to, to cushion that a little bit. Don't live to the full extent of your means, I guess is what I'm saying. Because we don't know going forward in six months to a year what that's going to look like. Um, there are some people saying that the stock market could see a 30 to 50% drop next year. Because it's crazy that these companies literally year over year have zero earnings after adjusted for inflation but they're trading at 18 times multiples. That can't go on very long. So something has to change. Either the earnings are going to have to come way up quickly or the valuations are going to come down, which means lowering stock prices. Um, the cost of Bitcoin, same thing. Uh, cryptocurrency right now, um, that's a whole separate topic. So I'm going to go to questions first, but then I'll tell you what's going on in the world of Bitcoin right now. There's some scary, scary stuff happening that if you have Bitcoin, now wouldn't be a bad time to liquidate it not because you want to run away from it, but because you want to buy back in when the price is lower 
and get either more coin for the same money or keep some of your money and buy the same amount of coins that you had before. All right, let's see here. Going back through the comments real quick. I handled a lot of these already. I just didn't mark them. So forgive me while I click. <laughs> click, click, click. Clicking like on everybody. That's how I figure out who I've talked to and who I haven't is I, I click like. Will there be a future Compute This shows for 2022? Oh, yes, Sebastian. Um, so next week's show will be recorded, so there won't be a Facebook feed for it, but it is new content. So, uh, so you're getting a new show uh, tomorrow, or tomorrow, next Sunday. Uh, and then, of course, uh, New Year's Day is the Thorstradamus show. Uh, it will also be pre-recorded, so there won't be video of that, but you'll be able to hear all the predictions of Thorstradamus. Uh, and so uh, everything that, that, that he thinks is going to happen in 2023, he will impart his knowledge to me um, in the form of, you know, complexly worded quatrains. And then I will pass that knowledge on to you, uh, and then we'll try to interpret it together as best we can. So, yes, you have two new shows coming, two new Compute This shows, but they're both pre-recorded, which is why there's no aftershocks. I won't be in the studio. I won't be in the studio Christmas Day or New Year's Day, sorry. I try. I, You know... That's why I say I think I'm getting old because previous years, Easter Sunday I was in here, Christmas I was in here, and over time, and this is going to sound so incredibly stupid, uh, but it's part of growing. Everybody does stupid things, right? How many Easter mornings did I miss with my kids because I was in the studio? That show is long gone. That Easter is long gone. But they got to open their Easter baskets without me there. Because they're not gonna, they ain't gonna wait till after the aftershock to open their Easter baskets. Are you kidding me? Um, you know, Christmas morning. Am I gonna miss Christmas morning with my kids, so I can do a show that I don't know how many people are listening to because they're all doing Christmas morning with their kids? So it, it's one of those things where, you know, in the past, younger Thor, more uh, single focused, single minded Thor would have been in here, Johnny on the spot, doing shows, doing aftershocks. Uh, lamenting how much I hate, and I genuinely hate the fact that every TV and radio personality takes off like the next two weeks. So there is no new content. They have fill-in hosts that are fill-ins for a reason because they can't do the job, so they're, they're fill-ins. Kind of like when they have me in to do a, a KFAB show during the week. It's not because I'm immensely talented. It's because they didn't have anybody else to call. I'm literally like, well, you could call Thor. <laughs> so yes, there will be new Compute This shows coming up. Alrighty. Weird. Content's not available anymore. Oh, that's weird. Okay. What about Malware Bytes? Did that one? Gosh, I did a lot of these guys. I must have been like reading them in real time. Don't tell anyone, but Lake of the Ozarks has generators in the dam. Our electricity costs are not going up. Most people use electricity to heat their homes or condos. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> well, you know, you're using clean energy, my man. Good stuff. How do I like driving in Omaha? Or Lincoln? Sebastian, you ask the weirdest questions, man. Like, my wife and I, we know, we know several people who are pastors. And pastors have an art of creating conversation out of ether with the most random questions. Um, yeah, and it, how do I like driving in Omaha or Lincoln? Well, Lincoln, driving across Lincoln sucks. Driving across Omaha isn't a big deal. Why? Because when you drive across Lincoln, there are three roads that bisect Lincoln from, from north to south. Three roads. None of them are interstates. They're all full of traffic lights. They all have 40 mile an hour or slower speed limits. So it literally takes you as long to drive across the city of Lincoln as it would take you to drive from Waverly to Gretna. So basically from city to city. You can drive the interstate and you can get between the cities in the same amount of time it takes you to drive across Lincoln. And that's just ridiculous. But what do you do about it, right? So th there was a proposal to, to install a, uh, um, a loop, a bypass in Lincoln. But it got stranded in committee because they couldn't agree on how many stoplights to put on the bypass. We gotta let people get off the bypass. So you put a stoplight on it? You build a ramp, dude. What the hell? A stoplight? That's the whole point of the bypass. There's no stopping. You 
bypass the stoplights because you're not going to those businesses. You don't have any intention of going to those. It's not like you're going to be driving down 84th Street and you know you weren't planning on stopping at Burger King, but you saw the Burger King and you thought, oh, damn, a Whopper. <gasps> you know, <laughs> that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Maybe it happens once in a while, right? But for the most part, unless you're really hungry, that doesn't happen. Or you're driving down the street and you're like, ooh, Kohl's. I wonder if they have a sale on cologne. You know, that doesn't happen. If you're going to Kohl's, you're going to Kohl's. You don't need stoplights on your bypass. So there is no bypass. There is no stoplights. It all died. And uh, it is what it is. So that's how I like driving in the cities. All right, good to have you, Jason. Uh, plus, when you sell your house in Nebraska, you have to pay an additional 2% tax to Lincoln. Yeah, Ronald, I was not aware of that 2% tax. I have to look into that. I didn't know what that was that they uh, they passed on there. If it was like, if you're selling a house and not buying a new one, or if you're selling a house and buying a new one, do you still have to pay the tax? Or how does that work? Or is it an exit tax? So like if you're leaving the state, for example, if you're selling your property and not purchasing another property, you know, then the state gives you a one last little, you know, have a great day. Illinois, it's like, you know, 90% or something when you leave the state. It's ridiculous. I'm retired. I got my house fixed the way I want it. It's paid for, and I don't want to buy someone else's problem. Ain't that right, Stephen? You know, that's the thing. You know, we're looking at all these houses. Now, the lovely Kimberly is a very handy person. She has done several home improvements. You might think that I'm the home improvement guy, right? But no. So, like, if we had a show, like a Chip and Joanna show, I would be Joanna. Except I can't design anything. Or decorate anything. I would just, I'd be like, wouldn't it be cool if we had screens? Like, <laughs> more screens. That's a, it needs more screens everywhere. Like, touch screens and voice commands. Where's where's the voice command speaker? You know, that, that would be Thor. So, the lovely Kimberly, she, she lays floors in the house. We redid the kitchen. The, the, the thing that I did, I, I patched the drywall. I can do that behind the tile backsplash. She did the tile backsplash. She remodeled the bathroom. Um, she did all the molding herself. Uh, she did the baseboards. She did the door trim. She looked up the style that our house was built in to determine the style that she should use and she should create for the trim. Because she did all the research before she just jumped into it. Thor would have been like, let's cut some wood. Kim's like, let's read a book first. I'm like, ah, oh, come on. Read a book. Watch a video. Come on. I'm going to, let's cut some wood. You know, and then of course that you get the results. You know, there's a reason that the lovely Kimberly has won the Schrock Household Gingerbread Contest for the last three years running, okay? There's a reason. So our house is fixed up the way we like it. We have a really nice house with a new kitchen and nice bathrooms and nice floors and new carpet. Why on earth would I move out of this house to buy another house that costs two times or three times as much as the one we're living in now, but looks like it was decorated by a 90-year-old woman with three cats. And the other houses, like, there was some guy living in there. Why is there always a red room? The red room. The anger room. Or the room that has, like, cherry wood bookshelves and a cherry wood desk and a red carpet. You're like, what do you do in this room? Like, this is like, I feel angry just looking at the picture. Like, ew. And I'm like, why would I sell what I have that I like so much to buy something that definitely has potential? It's got some land around it. I could have my own chickens. You know what? Um, you know, we could do these things. But man, we're giving up something that we put so much into for something that needs so much work and costs so much more. Why would we do that? And that's the, that's the problem. That's the reason why there's not a lot of the, the, the housing market is not tanking, like, but the number of transactions has dropped off dramatically just because people who are in houses, why would they leave? And people who are looking for houses are people who are moving out of renting uh, because they're trying to escape escalating rents to at least get something that's fixed that they know isn't going to go up, but then no one's told them about property taxes yet and how that impacts your mortgage payment. The lessons you learn in life. All righty. I bought a rust-free 93 Chevy pickup that needs a different engine I will be money ahead to replace it and be car payment free. People are about to learn the difference between price and value and want and need. You know, this is true, Brad. Um, I guess I was thinking back to when I was a kid, right? 
And, you know, my family was not wealthy. Uh, we would be best described as, as sort of middle class. You know, we weren't poor. Both of my parents worked. My mom was college educated. My dad worked real hard. He was a salesman, and he could sell just about anything to anybody. Um, but except for insurance. He tried to do insurance, and even he was like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> Don't sell insurance. Uh, all you insurance salesmen out there are nodding your head. You know. You're like, yeah, it's, it ain't fun. Um, when your dad comes up to your 13-year-old kid and says, can I have your school directory because, you know, I'm going to call all the parents in it and try to sell them insurance. Hi, your son, Jonathan, goes to school with my son. Um, just thought I'd give you a call and see if your insurance needs were taken care of. I mean, literally, that's what you have to do. <laughs> it, was, it was so embarrassing. So anyway, but, you know, growing up, I, I, had, a, I had one bike, you know, my entire childhood. Um, I finally got a dog when I was 13 and it was a used dog, you know, <laughs> it was somebody else's do adult dog that they were getting rid of. <laughs> so I got a basset hound, I got a used basset hound, 13 years old. Um, you know, the house we lived in was, my parents owned it. He bought it from a friend who gave him a good deal on it after he rented it for many years from, uh, from her. Um, it was a good house in a good neighborhood. You know, like any house, it had its issues. Uh, like any neighborhood, it had its issues. But for the most part, the Metcalf neighborhood is pretty solid, right? So growing up, you know, there was always things we wanted. My parents always drove used cars. Um, my mom loved to drive gunboats, like those 70s cars that were like four doors and a V8 engine and, you know, five miles long. She loved those things. And they kind of float as you drive them, you know. Um, and, you know, you go and you go, I remember going car shopping with my dad. Dad, get that car. Dad, that car's cool. Get that car. And my dad's like, no, I think we're going to get the sensible car, son. And, you know, he didn't say it like that, but that's what he was doing. You know, he was buying the car. He wasn't going to get the Sunfire with the convertible top that came out. Wow, Dad. Um, he was looking for something to go around and do sales calls in. So he was going to get something that's a little more practical for that. Um, did I want toys? Yeah, I... I remember when I got my first Atari 2600, and I couldn't believe that my parents spent $150 in 1980s money on this video game system. It was a gift for the family, you see, in the same way I think I bought a gift for the family that I'm going to enjoy a lot this year, too. Um, so anyway, we all played on it, though, and then we all had fun with it, and, you know, it's one of those things where you, you have wants and you have needs. And everybody wants something, right? Um, everybody needs things. And I feel blessed that, that for the most part, I feel like I'm at a place, like, I want the Z, Flip, the Z Fold phone. I don't know why I want it. It's stupid, right? My phone is great. It's a year and a half old. There's nothing wrong with it. It works great. The, the Z Fold has specifications that are almost identical. They're slightly faster, slightly more memory. But the thing folds in half, which is pretty cool. Why do I need a phone that folds in half? I don't. But I want it anyway. Do I need it? Hell no. No, I don't. And that's why I don't have it. Because even me, even, even though I could go out and buy it tomorrow, it, I, could go, I could buy it right now on the Internet and be just fine. But I don't need it. And that's, I think... 20 years ago, I'd have already bought that phone because I could to show other people that I could. And I think as you get older, you kind of realize a little bit that it's not, that's not the point, right? And then when times get a little uncertain and the rules of the game change, which none of us complained when the rules changed, you know, oh gosh, that was 2001. So 21 years ago when the rules of the game changed, that was 9-11. And that's, what, that's when the whole easy money lifestyle started. That's when the interest rates started to go down. That's when all the money printing started to stimulate the economy. Then we had the TARP bailout. Remember TARP? $600 billion. Oh, my gosh, it was so much money. <laughs> oh, wow, I wish we could only have $600 billion increases now. That'd be great. Um, and then you had all the... You know, the other spending, then you had the pandemic spending, then you had Obamacare in there, it's more spending, you know, all the spending, the spending, the spending, and then all of a sudden, here we are today. Now the rules of the game 
are changing and people are not recognizing. You have an entire generation of financial planners who have never worked in an environment with high interest rates. And by high, I mean more than 4%. They've never seen it in their lives. And they're working in that now. And they're planning your money in that. I want the old guy who was around in the 70s, who's so close to retirement that every year he tells himself he's going to do it, but he can't tear himself away because he loves what he does. That's the guy that I want managing my money. Somebody who's seen this before. And what are those people doing? What are the Warren Buffetts of the world doing right now? They're staying heavy cash and they're buying hard assets. They're buying things and not companies. Why is that? Because the rules are changing and they've seen this game before. There are certain inevitabilities that are going to happen. There's going to be nice words. There's going to be talk. But eventually, reality will assert itself as it always does. And when that happens, and no one can predict when it's going to happen, you're absolutely right. People are going to figure out the difference between a need and a want. Not because they're going to become suddenly wise, but because they're, it's going to be foist upon them. They're going to be forced to, to choose between things they want and things they need. And it won't be pleasant. And I remember, you know, and when you're a little kid, you don't always remember or understand why you do things. But I remember at one point, my sister and I, we decided we were going to help mom and dad save electricity in the house. And we were only going to use flashlights. <laughs> That's kid logic, right? Lower the electric bill by using flashlights that run on really expensive batteries. You know, <laughs> it's great. Um, but we were going to save electricity by only using flashlights. And so for like three days, we were under blankets with flashlights, reading books. And my parents were like, what are you doing? We're reading books, Mom. Like, don't argue with that. Because, um, and then why did we think that? I'm sure that at some point we heard our parents talking about some financial stress or maybe we just sensed it. You know, that you know, it, it was the late 70s, early 80s. Um, my mom was told me before, it was, it was ridiculous. You know, you'd go to the grocery store to buy a, a cart of groceries. And that cart of groceries last week cost you $20. And I'm just sitting here like, $20 for a cart of groceries? You can't get a bag of groceries for $20 now. Not even a small bag, like one of those Hallmark card bags. Even those can cost more than $20 now. So, and she goes, you go back the next week, you buy the exact same cart of stuff, and it would be $25. That's how fast it was going up. So now you're a family with young kids going through that. That had to be incredibly stressful. That is what families are going through right now. My wife and I, are, we know families that, that, you know, people don't always, when they're in need, they don't go out and ask, right? And But you can tell when you see the small things. And so when you're giving people things for Christmas, for example, and you're giving kids hoodies and stuff like that, it's because they need them. And you're trying, to, you're trying to help. You're trying to help your friends of your family, basically. You're trying to be a positive influence in their lives. And it, it's impacting people. Like, we're talking about, like, you know, used car prices are falling, blah, 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 you know. And most people don't really care about that. They're, they're just trying to put food on the table. They're just trying to get by. And when you have that situation, and you you're look at the macroeconomics of what's coming, and you say, what the hell can you do? Well, you can lock in anything that you can lock in at a fixed price. Anything you can lock in at a fixed price is a win right now. Anything. Whether that's rents or mortgages or anything. You can all, if the interest rates come down later, you can always refinance your mortgage later. Buy a house. If the, if the interest rates go up, well, you're happy you bought when you did. Let's see. Oh, Richard, what's to talk about with the border invasion? Yeah, he says, you got you talking 40 minutes on inflation. I guess you don't want to talk about the, the border invasion next. What's to talk about? It's the same story, different day. I don't even read the articles anymore. It's the same story, different day, 
way worse. You know, the mayor of Denver issued a state of emergency because like 800 migrants this month came to Denver. 800 in a month. Oh, we need federal money. I mean, on the border, the 800 in a month, that'd be like, sweet. You know, we have extra budget surplus, you know. Um, I'm frustrated because on one hand, I definitely see we don't have enough employees in this country. We need more people. Number two, the people that are coming are not people that can do the jobs that I need them to do. Number three, the people that are coming are not coming legally. So therefore, there's this cloud over their heads. There's a cloud over your head if you employ them. There's all the social costs involved because the people that are coming illegally are barred from properly entering the, the fabric of society. So therefore, they're even more reliant on the social safety nets and non-government organizations like churches, things like that, to exist, to survive. Or they form little encampments where you know, they gather together and they, they pitch tents and they make a little shanty town somewhere. How is that safe or legitimate or providing a better future for your children? You know, and you can make all kinds of arguments one way or the other. I'm not here going to make those arguments today. All I'm saying is I'm tired of talking about it because it doesn't matter what you're going to say. Nothing is going to happen. The only time something is going to happen is when reality meets consequences. I don't know who's going to have to, who's who's high end political person is going to have to get attacked or killed or you know whatever. Something is going to happen, and it's going to snap. And when it snaps, what are you going to do? How do you fix what's happened here? It's almost like an unfixable problem. You can't solve the problem and maintain your moral superiority by basically just force deporting all of these people out. Like get out. Get out of my house right now. I don't care. Oh, sad, sad, sad. I don't care. Get out. So you can't do that. Because, number one, you're a bad person. I mean, some of these people, I mean, they've been here their entire lives. They're kids, you know? And you're going to just kick them out into a country they've never known before? That doesn't, that doesn't work. On the other hand, you're clearly not willing to do anything to stop them from coming in. So, in fact, some might even argue you're encouraging it. Why? Because they're eventually voting Republican now is what the numbers are showing. So why on earth are it? Why are you doing it, Democrats? I don't understand. I don't understand. But nothing is going to change until reality meets consequences. And that's not going to happen anytime real soon. So again, I fall back on, I have control over my family. I have control over my community. I have some degree of control over the city that I live in. I have a vote or a say in the state that I live in. Anything beyond that, there's nothing I can do about that right now. There's nothing I can do about that right now. So I'm going to control the things I can control, and I'm going to leave the rest to God because you'll go crazy trying to control them all yourself. So yes, I read the news, and yes, I see the headlines, and I see that Title 42 is ending, and, uh, you know, are they deporting anybody now under Title 42? I mean, are they? Um, yeah, it's going to end right before Christmas. No coincidence there. You know, have Merry Christmas, everybody, you know, when everybody's traveling and not paying attention. So uh, I think, I don't know. I guess the thing that concerns me most, people are people. People are smart. Sorry, persons are smart. Persons have brains. Persons can produce. Persons just want to have a good life. That's all they're trying to do. People make stupid decisions. People get spooked. People get scared. People suffer the consequences of a person's decisions. So I don't know what the solution to this problem is. Obviously, you know, if I'm being a logical person, the first thing you do if you find yourself in a hole is you stop digging. So you put the shovel down. Number one, put the shovel down. 
Number two, assess your situation. How deep is the hole? Is, the, is it craving in on me? Can I climb out of it? What's it going to take to get out of this hole? And then number three, how do you solve the problem? But we're not even willing to do number one. So until, that, until we're willing to do number one, there's no point of worrying about number two or number three. There is no handling number two or number three. In fact, number two and number three are going to cause people to handle number one eventually. Eventually. Because nobody wants to live in unsafe communities surrounded by shanty towns with people pooping on the street. Nobody wants to be in Los Angeles. Well, some people obviously do, but I don't. Nobody wants to live that way. Even people in, in Seattle are starting to get fed up with it. Even people in New York, they darn near voted, elected a Republican governor because they're fed up with it. Um, give it another few years, I guess. Is someone in the studio clicking their fingers? There's a clock ticking. If they're clicking rhythmically, like... I mean, that's the clock. I can't do anything about that. It's super quiet in here right now. Alrighty. Why is Google having all the virus threat problems? Oh, you mean like the Android operating system? Well, whenever you, whenever you have a computing platform that a lot of people use, it's going to get attacked. Um, Apple has its share of, of problems. That's why they push out updates. Um, Windows obviously does. Even Apple users are infected all the time. Uh, Apple users are infected way more often than they believe they are. Uh, and they stay infected longer because they don't do anything to prevent infection, typically. So uh, that's why one of the reasons when we install Sophos on Macs in the service centers, um, you know, when we install it, we're like, oh, yeah, and it removed like, two threats because they look at the threat report and they're like, why are there threats in the threat report? Well, that's what it removed from your computer after we installed it. And they're like, oh, damn, that, that's not good. Um, so, yeah. When are you coming to Kansas City with a story? We should have been here... You know, we should have power so that a few things happened. Number one, we put in the Des Moines Service Center, um, which launched amazingly well, and then we immediately got crushed by a staffing situation. Um, one of the reasons that we opened Des Moines, the, the main reason we opened Des Moines, is we wanted to open a service center that was geographically distant enough, but close enough at the same time that we could get there if we had to, but geographically distant enough that we have to, it's a test of our systems. And what we found is some of our systems are lacking, specifically transferring of the, the inventory PARs. We have to keep more stuff on hand at more distant service centers the further away they are from our central papillion warehouse. Number two, staffing problems. Um, when we have three, three service centers within a 60 mile radius of each other, we can move staff around, uh, we can have uh, lower individual store levels of staffing because we have more available employees in the pool that we can pull from in the event someone calls out sick or something like that. In Des Moines, that's not the case. So the problem there is, is we have to have more employees on hand in a service center that is lower volume because it's newer. The Lincoln Service Center has been around for 24 years. The repeat business is through the roof. It takes five years for one of our service centers to really establish itself. We opened that one in 2020. So basically we had the pandemic pop and now, so we don't even know what a real number looks like out of that service center because every number we've had has been pandemic influenced, whether it was the 2020, like I need to buy a computer to work from home, or the 2021, um, I have a bunch of stimulus money, so I'm going to buy a gaming computer. Or now here we are in 2022, and what we're finding is that year over year, our service centers overall are flat. So our repeat customers are still doing business with us, but we're not seeing those huge sales coming in of like $70,000 sales to a, to a business for, you know, 50 new computers. You know, we're not seeing those purchases this year. And that was something that we saw a lot of in Des Moines. Now, the other problem with Des Moines, um, we need more staff because we need more on-site capability. Because Des Moines has more geographically distant uh, satellite communities. So, you know, you can go to Waukee or you can go to Des Moines or you can go to West Des Moines. Um, you can go to Clyde, you can go to uh, uh, Johnson, you can go, you can go all over the place. And they're all, all the communities are virtually identical and they're all 30 minutes apart. And so anytime you have a, an onsite, you, you're taking a staff member and you're sending them out in a vehicle 30 minutes one way, 30 minutes back, plus the onsite time. 
Um, so how many onsites can a person do in a day? So there are some limitations that we are learning, basically. Um, so how do you solve those limitations? Well, the, the cannonball approach is you don't open one service center, you open three. And you hire a huge number of people that can float between the service centers and you build an entire management structure around that local cluster of service centers, a region, if you will. And so what we're learning is the standalone service center does not work real well. We need to have a cluster of service centers if we're to, to justify having the middle management to manage those service centers, to justify the number of people that we have to hire and moving them about so we can get efficiency so that we don't have people standing around in one service center do, with nothing to do while another service center is completely barren of people and not opening because we don't have anybody. You know, we, we, these are the challenges that we're facing. So to answer your question, we're going to probably open more service centers in the near future. We probably are not going to open in Kansas City in the next couple of years, and that's why we pulled the radio show. Um, it, it was basically a two-year plan that we were going to run the radio show for two years, and then we were going to open the Kansas City Service Center. We knew after seeing the num the numbers coming out of Des Moines are great. The customers are amazing. Everybody loves us there. There's no, there's no, don't worry about losing your Des Moines Service Center. Everything is good there. We just need more. We need more service centers. We need to expand. Now, the problem is, is the population is thin. So, you know, right now we have one service center and all these satellite communities are doing business with that one. Well, if we put another one 30 minutes away, then now we've split that in half. We have double the staff, but each shop has half the business. So that means we also have to increase the marketing budget. Great question. Where do you spend your marketing dollars these days? We're already on radio. We have AM radio. We have FM radio. Um, the only thing that our advertising marketing company tells us to do is put commercials on TV news, which did work really well when we opened the service center. The problem is it is stupid expensive, like mind-bogglingly counterproductively expensive. So what other options do we have? Do we have anything creative? What about Hulu? What about the new Netflix ads? You know, what? We don't know anything about those. So part of this is developing those systems in order to you know, we grow very organically. Customers tell their kids about us, tell their friends about us. Then they come in and then they tell their friends and their kids and then they come in. So we grow very organically. But when you're opening three service centers in a geographically small area, you can't have slow organic growth. You need to, you need to be, it's, it, it has to be like you're opening the first Chick-fil-A in town and people flock. You know what I mean? No pun intended. That's what you need to have. And that's what we're working on creating and figuring out. In the meantime, though, opening that one service center was like a half a million dollar expense um, of, of outlay between staffing, training, uh, building, equipping, advertising, marketing, the whole bit. So to open up three service centers at one time, you do the math, plus it's probably going to cost a little bit more than it used to, so you do the math. And all of a sudden, this is a huge, huge expense, an expense that if we took on at one time at the wrong time, could endanger the entire company. So we have to be frugal about how we handle this. We have to be smart about the timing of our investment. Um, if you believe that rents are going to be coming down over the next few years a little bit, or at least inflating less, maybe we wait a little to sign the next lease. You know, maybe maybe we negotiate for multiple locations at the same time from the same business rather than separate locations at separate times. You know, there's a lot of different ways that we can that we can skin this. But to answer your question in a very long format way, that's what is going on with Kansas City. We probably aren't going to be down there anytime in the near future. In other words, the next three years. Um, but we haven't forgotten about it. One of the things that we, it's weird to see this, but. We had a shortage of staff, right? So you've probably seen me more in the service centers. You hear me telling stories about all the customers I'm talking to in the service centers. Um, it's important that I stay in the service center from time to time. Uh, number one, it keeps me connected with you. It, it helps me understand the, the problems that you're facing so that when I talk on the radio, I'm not talking from broadcasting from my ivory tower. You know, I, I actually know what's going on. But number two, if I spend 36 hours a week in the service centers, which is what I've been having to do, that doesn't give me a lot of time to visit the Good Idea Ferry. And the Good Idea Ferry 
has an 80-20 principle, and that's what the lovely Kimberly is for. 80% of my good ideas are crap, and she filters them out for me. 20% of them are solid gold, and she scores those for me. Um, so the problem is if I'm working 36 hours in the service center, those ideas are not happening because I just don't have the time of the day. So now that we are finally getting, I think we're going to have, we have a new front desk starting Monday in Omaha. We've hired another technician in Omaha. We will be full staff in Omaha for the first time in six months on Monday. Now that doesn't mean they're trained, mind you. <laughs> they still got to be trained, but full staff. We'll have, we'll have the right number of people in the building. Um, it's, been, it's been a rough six months, guys, as from a staffing perspective. So now that that's done, I, I'm starting to pull myself back a little bit and, and having them lean less on me, more rely on themselves, but I'm pulling back a little bit and saying, okay, what is the software that we need? What systems do we need to support locations that are distant? Um, how, do, how do we do corporate services in Des Moines? How is it different than what, how we do it here? You know, what do we need? So those are the kind of things that have to go into it to, to develop behind the scenes. Then once we have that in place, then we can have unparalleled growth. We can have, you know, finance growth even, where we were borrowing money to do it because we, we, we know the model's going to work. That was why we opened Des Moines the way we did. We tested one model. We had success financially, so the, the, the location is profitable, but it wasn't the success that we had predicted. It wasn't what we were looking for. It wasn't a failure, but it wasn't a huge success. And it wasn't a big enough success that we want to do it five more times in a row. We're going to tweak the plan, change it, test it. How do you test it? We're going to test it in Des Moines. And so that's, that's what's going to happen. So then once we have that system down, when we know what a cluster of service centers look like, what kind of revenue we can expect per capita from that cluster of service centers, how many new customers we can acquire from a particular radio station in a particular time, are there other methods of advertising that we can use that are financially suitable but allow us to reach the right number of people. Once we have all that in a nice little package, then we take that nice package to Kansas City and we drop it there because Kansas City is a much bigger market than Omaha and Omaha is a bigger market than Lincoln and is a bigger market than Des Moines is, you know, ironically larger than Omaha from a, they're considered a larger media market even though the population is about the same so it's kind of weird. But Kansas City there is no there is no no bones about it. It's a bigger media market and it's a bigger population center. It's going to require multiple locations to cover it properly. Go. And that's it. Last call for questions, guys. The Seattle office is not in the plan at this point. No, I'm sorry, Bob. Not quite yet. I use the Des Moines shop. Just showing that many of us have quite a drive into the shark business. Showing that many of us have quite a drive. Yeah, um, and that's the thing. So from, from the perspective of operating a service center, if you're willing to drive 30 minutes to come in, why would I put another service center closer to you? Because I'm just going to cannibalize the one I already have. Sure, it will be convenient for you, but you're already a customer. The question is how many people are not willing to drive 30 minutes to come in? How many people have not realized how awesome we are that we're worth that 30-minute drive? We offer free pickup and free drop-off. But very few people utilize it for some reason. I don't know why. So if we're offering free pickup and free drop-off and no one's utilizing it, those are people that we're not reaching for some reason. There's something else that's not right that we have to figure out. And so that's what we're... And it's a constant tweaking game. It's a constant game of adjusting the message, having something that is uh, timely, um, that is... You know, for example, we're already starting to think about the ultimate upgrade next year. Uh, the ultimate upgrade is a sale, a trade-in sale that we do where you can trade in your old computer, right? Um, you can trade in your old computer for a discount on a new computer. And it's one of our most popular computer sales. We sell more units during that sale of computers than we sell during any other time. The, but the challenge, though, is you know, during the holiday special, you're selling $1,600 high-end computers. During the ultimate upgrade, you're selling $450 entry-level computers. So it's a different it's a different customer. It's a different demographic. There's not as you know people don't add things as much on the ultimate upgrades as they do on the holiday specials. Um, you know it's harder to sell a warranty, for example, on a four hundred and fifty dollar computer than it is to sell it on a sixteen hundred dollar computer, for example. Um, even though the warranty is the same and the warranty provides the same great level of service, 
it's just harder to justify it on a four hundred and fifty dollar computer. So those are some of the some of the inside the inside baseball stuff that we consider when we're doing stuff. Oh yes, the Bitcoin update. Okay, so for those of you who are into cryptocurrency, um, there was a okay. So you, you've obviously probably have heard about FTX by now. Big exchange, uh, Sam Bakeman fried your money. Um, he was going to bail out BlockFi. He was going to bail out uh, a bunch of other places. Um, as a result of FTX collapsing, there was collateral damage that resonated through the crypto market and caused Bitcoin to drop in value. Recently, we've seen, right after I sold, uh, we saw an increase of $1,700 a coin. Uh, but anyway, you know, don't try to time the market. And so uh, it went up. But... Now the question is, what's going to happen next? So the big, the big gorilla in the room right now is Binance. They're the largest. They, have, they went from a 7% market share. as They're an exchange. They had 7% of all the exchange activity in the cryptocurrency world before FTX collapsed. After, they now have 27%. Very much like FTX, they have their own stable coin. Very much like FTX, they have never had an independent audit done. Very much like FTX, they say, look at the amount of cryptocurrency that we have. Aren't we financially stable? And they're not showing you the liabilities ledger of how much they owe people. So Binance called in an auditor that is known for auditing crypto firms. And did, well, they won't call it, the firm wouldn't call it an audit. They called it a report because it wasn't an audit. Um, they said that this report was generated under very specific rules, basically. The, they only let them measure one coin at a time. So now imagine a scenario where you're trying to make it look like you have way more Bitcoin than you have. So you might sell all your other cryptocurrency and buy a bunch of Bitcoin and say, look at all my Bitcoin, I'm the man. And then, okay, next week we're going to check your Ethereum. All right, sounds good. So I sell all my Bitcoin and I buy a bunch of Ethereum. Look at all my Ethereum, I'm the man. Yeah, you see how that's a, that's a fraud, right? Now, I'm not saying Binance is doing that, but what I'm saying is the firm that created the report just removed it from their website a couple days ago without any comment. In other words, they don't want to tie their name to that. It makes you wonder what the problem is at Binance. It makes you wonder what's going on there. It made a lot of people wonder, so many people wondered, that Binance saw $10 billion of cryptocurrency leave their exchange in a two-day period. Now, Binance says, we are fully capitalized, one-to-one. -one. If you give us cryptocurrency to hold on an exchange, it goes into a wallet. We don't commingle. We don't spend your money. We don't do any of that stuff. In fact, we are so financially responsible, we even have an OBEEP fund. Like, this is our, our reserve fund over here of this bajillion dollars of cryptocurrencies that's a reserve fund in case something goes wrong, then we're covered. Question, if you're one-to-one -one reserve covered, what's going to go wrong? Why do you need a reserve fund? Is it in case leverage bets go wrong? What are those leverage bets? Are you propping up the value of your own stable coin, kind of like FTX was doing? And now it's coming out that FTX actually engineered the Luna collapse because the last time Luna had an issue, a bunch of people bought FTX as stablecoin instead. So now they're thinking that Luna and Almeida co worked together to crash Luna, which was the thing that set off this huge catalyst in the first place that bankrupted a bunch of companies, uh, Three Arrows Capital. You know, literally, that's what started the chain reaction trying to save FTX. And then now FTX is gone. Uh, Binance blew the whistle on FTX to destroy them to take go from 7% to 27% market share. Well, if there's a problem in Binance, just like I just talked about how we're trying to open service centers and expand our coverage areas and, and the, the complexities that go into that from a business perspective, now imagine overnight, overnight, your business went from 7% market share to 27% of the market overnight. That would be like me saying, overnight, we sold more computers than Dell now. Go. Our systems are not, we can't handle that. We're not designed to be Dell. We are not Dell. 
We are not designed to sell millions of computers a year. That's not what we do. Yes, we sell computers, but we sell service. We are a service company that happens to offer hardware. If you don't want to buy our service, we don't want to sell you hardware. The hardware is the portal to our service, very much like Apple's model. You want the ecosystem, you buy the Apple hardware. Is the Apple hardware better? In some ways, maybe. In other ways, not. But if you want the ecosystem, you buy the hardware. So getting back to Binance, Binance right now is seeing massive outflows. People are just taking their cryptocurrency and, and holding it in their private wallets now. They're like, I don't trust any exchange anymore. Now the question is, can Binance survive this if it hangs on long term, if people keep pulling money out? What if there's another drop in the value of Bitcoin, which there always is in January? January to April is always a bad time for crypto. Tax time. Now this year might be different. There's a lot of losses, right? I sold my Bitcoin so I could sell it at a loss. Um, full well knowing that it was gonna, I think it's gonna drop and I'll be able to buy it back and I'll, I'll make some money there. So I'm gonna, they call it harvesting your tax loss so I can claim that on my taxes because the government wants my crypto info. Here you go, boys. Um, and in the meantime, next year, maybe I'll have a, a profitable transaction. We'll see. Um, in the meantime, just like Warren Buffett, I'm in cash. I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and wait, see, see what opportunities present themselves. Um, so anyway, that's what's going on with the world of cryptocurrency. And as goes Bitcoin, as goes Ethereum and all the crap coins underneath it, um, even one of your biggest performers, Dogecoin. For no apparent reason whatsoever, they were only down 13% this month. Top performer. So that tells you the, the mood of the industry right now. It's definitely crypto winter. Um, but the thing is, this is cyclical. Like all industries, this is a cyclical industry. Like, I hate to be a pessimist about this, but eventually the Federal Reserve will begin to loosen monetary policy again. They're tightening the screws right now to try to get inflation under control. Eventually, they're going to loosen it up. And when that happens, you are going to see an explosion in the value of risk assets as money gets cheaper. Watch for that. Wait for that. Be prepared for that. So when you know, buy, buy your Bitcoin cheap when you can. I'm targeting 10 to 15,000, you know, somewhere in that range. I'll probably start buying around 14,000 small increments. Hopefully it gets down to 10 and then that's my entry point. Then if it goes to 150,000 in two or three years, I'll be very happy. Because uh, what other investments in this world are you going to get that do that um, for, the, for that small of a cost? Some people are listening to this right now thinking, this man is crazy. <laughs> I know you're there. I know you're there. All right, last call, guys. Uh, Thor and Kimberly have a great family Christmas and New Year's. Well, thank you, Ron. I appreciate it. Uh, and we will. Uh, we, uh, it, it's so awesome to have little kids. Anyone who's had little kids around Christmas time knows, you know, when you catch one of them, like, trying to, my, my daughter's special needs, so sometimes she just gets it in her head it's time to open a present, even though it's not. She'll try to, you'll catch her trying to open one. She knows she's not supposed to, so she's sneaking. You know, you're like, Katie, Katie, no, no open. No, don't open it. Um, and then, you know, Lou is just, in, just super excited every morning to do his advent calendar right now, his chocolate calendar. Have I done my chocolate calendar yet today? Like the days are blending together. Did I do that this morning or did I not do that this morning? No, you don't get an extra piece of chocolate, kid. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, okay, you have to open, you know, today you're going to open day 18. That's 1-8. So even the chocolate calendars are an educational experience because he has to find the numbers. He might not know what 18 looks like because he's only four, but he knows what a 1 is and he knows what an 8 is. So 1-8. I find a 1-8 and I can open that door and get a piece of chocolate. See, you sneak it in on him whenever you can. Well, it's going on longer than usual because it's the last one of the year, my man. Sebastian, are you getting tired? Hold on, let me let me get a drink, and then we can continue. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my wife's going to kill me. Well, no, actually, my wife has a prescription she needs me to pick up at Hy-Vee at 10 o'clock. So if I go another four minutes, that'll be right on time. No. Uh, no, but thank you guys very much for joining us. It means a lot to me that you're here for the Aftershock especially. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things, like, I used to believe that there's two sides to 
the political questions in life that surrounds us, that there's my side, the right side, and there's the wrong side, people who disagree. Um, compromise is not fun, especially when it always seems to be your team willing to compromise and the other team willing not to give an inch. Um, and so you want to respond by not giving an inch and then you end up at an impasse because neither end is giving an inch. Politics has always been this way. There's nothing new under the sun. The, the names have changed, the rules have changed, and maybe we get rid of some of these 80-year-olds. It will be the exact same stuff with more emotional outbursts. So you're the first Gen Z guy got elected to Congress. Um, he was trying to get a, an apartment in Washington, um, but no one will rent to him because his credit's so bad. His excuse is, I spent a lot of money on my campaign, so I had to, I used my credit cards to get elected to Congress. Which, I would ask what your plan is to pay that money back on a congressman's salary, but I think I, I think we can all know what the plan is. Um, but it's just, it blows my mind. I, I said, I was talking with Frank in the Papillion Service Center. I don't understand why anybody gets involved in politics anymore. Like, it's always been nasty. It's always been personal. But now you're, you're talking about the absolute destruction of your life if you get in the wrong person's way. Like, there are, there are no holds barred. Like, there is, no, there is nothing sacred, especially if your name is Trump. There's nothing holy. Um, you know, they will, they're going after every member of his family. They're going after every business deal he ever did. Anything that they can do to find any dirt. And, you know, love him or hate him, I mean, the guy signed up to be president of the United States. He signed up to serve in a job that paid him, was it $400,000 a year? where you have to buy all your own clothes, you have to pay for all your own personal stuff, you have to buy all your own food. Government doesn't buy all that for you. You have to pay for that when you're president. And you have to go to all these events and your wife needs a new dress for every event. It's, and you can't just go to you know, Kohl's and buy a dress off the rack. You gotta buy the designer dresses. You know, So I mean, it's not a cheap, let's just say, there are, there are probably other ways that Trump could have spent his time and made a lot more money. This Trump NFT trading card things that he's doing right now makes me question his sanity a little bit right now. Like, are you going, is this like when Ted Cruz got fat and grew a beard? Um, like, what, what's happening here? Um, are you really going to run for president again? Or is this just a plot for you to sell NFTs? Is, are you trying to, to, to be the businessman now instead of the person that people want to elect. So I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, nobody really does. So all you can do is be th very thankful for the positive things you have in your life. And you guys are some of the positive things that are in my life. And I'm very thankful for you. I'm very thankful for my employees. I'm very thankful for my family and my amazing wife. Um, just if as a young man you would have told me this is where I was going to be, I wouldn't have believed you, number one. Number two, I would have found some way to screw it up. Because <laughs> that's what young men do, right? Um, but it's just an, an amazing unfolding of fates that have led me to where I'm at now. Um, and it means the world to me that you guys are with me on this ride. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas that you all have time with your families. Aaron, I hope you get out of the care facility. Are you still in the care facility, Aaron? <laughs> I hope you get out. Um, and I hope everybody has a great new year. And we will talk to you again. Officially, you'll hear from me again before the new year, of course. But we'll talk in person again in 2023. Thanks for joining us, guys, and have a great afternoon.